Ubuntu 25.04 is out, or it should be in a matter of hours, depending on when you actually watch this specific video. It's nicknamed the Blocky Puffin, and it has all the usual changes from GNOME that you might expect. If you watched the GNOME 48 video, you know what it's about, but it also comes with its own set of changes specific to Ubuntu. So we're gonna take a look at this new version of the distro, and we're gonna take a look at our... Sp it's even running in the background. We're gonna take a look at our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Tuxcare. They offer leading enterprise patching and support services that ensure that your Linux fleet stays secure and up to date, but without the maintenance hassle. They have a multi-distro rebootless patching tool called Kernel Care Enterprise, which lets you apply security updates to your systems without any reboot or without planning complex maintenance windows that cause downtime. And with their endless lifecycle support services, you can get security patches for end-of-life Linux distros, for software languages, and for frameworks like Spring and .NET, so you get years of affordable long-term security. And Tuxcare now offers custom Linux kernel development and maintenance services. Now, whether you need to integrate specialized hardware with custom drivers or to ensure compatibility with old legacy systems, or you want to harden your kernel with advanced security modules, Tuxcare can handle it all. They can strip out unnecessary drivers and subsystems, they can tweak kernel parameters for ultra-low latency or high throughput, and they can even certify modifications to meet regulatory requirements like FIPS or FedRAMP. In short, if a custom Linux kernel is what your specific operations need, but you don't really know where to start, just ask Tuxcare. They have all the know-how and expertise to make sure that everything goes smoothly. You can click the link in the description of the video to learn more about all of Tuxcare's offerings and services. Okay, so let's begin with the Ubuntu-specific changes, and then we'll move on to the changes in GNOME 48 that Ubuntu actually picked up. Now, as you install Ubuntu, you'll notice you have a few more options and they are laid out a bit more clearly uh, when you want to erase the entire disk to install Ubuntu, whether you want to erase the already installed version of Ubuntu and reinstall over it, or whether you want to install Ubuntu alongside another system. And in that case, if the other system is a Windows partition that has been encrypted with BitLocker, it will let you install straight from the installer uh, instead of having to disable BitLocker first, which is really nice. There are also some smaller visual changes. You'll notice in this space specifically with application icons, all the icons that take the shape of that sort of squircle thing, uh, like this square with rounded corners, they've all been scaled down just a tiny bit, so they look more right next to the non-squared circle icons. They used to be a bit bigger, and so they stood out a bit too much, they were too big, and they've been resized a little bit. There's also a new Yaru icon for the system profiler, which is uh, this thing Ubuntu pre-installed for some reason, which is mostly for developers to see if their application uses too many resources or not. Now, another change you might notice is Ubuntu now pre-installs papers as its document and PDF a viewer instead of the old events that I installed for comparison here. Papers is a GTK4 and Libadvita application, something that events is apparently not really able to be because, well, it is a GTK3 app and apparently porting it fully to GTK4 is a lot more complicated than you'd expect, meaning basically some of the developers of events forked it into Papers it doesn't have the exact same feature set just yet, which is probably why Papers on the left here is not the default in GNOME, but it is definitely at some point going to replace the older events when it has caught up in terms of features. Honestly, if you just open PDF documents and you read them and you add a few annotations, this is more than enough and it will look much better integrated with your system with the GDK4 and Libadvita look rather than events with its older GDK3 style. 
Now, under the hood, Ubuntu also moved to another geolocation API, which is called Beacon DB. It's what they use to power the automatic time zone detection, but also what they use to power nightlight here uh, to automatically switch nightline on and off depending on your time zone. It is replacing the older Mozilla location service, which is now defunct and cannot be used anymore. Ubuntu 25.04 also comes with NVIDIA Dynamic Boost pre-configured. Uh, this is something that will only be useful if you do have an NVIDIA-based system with an NVIDIA GPU and if you have a relatively recent NVIDIA GPU. But what it does is it lets the NVIDIA GPU draw more power in your system while the CPU draws a bit less power. So the power envelope stays the same, but the GPU takes more of it while the CPU takes less of it. This is important for certain scenarios where the CPU isn't that crucial, but the GPU GPU really is, like certain video games, but also certain compute tasks. Previously you had to configure this thing manually in case your system was supported. Now Ubuntu will turn it on automatically if your system supports it. Now there are some smaller changes. Ubuntu disabled the startup sound by default, which you can of course re-enable if you like it. They had turned it on by default for the previous LTS, if I remember correctly, because it was the nostalgic boot up sound. But obviously, now that this gimmick is done, they disabled it. Now, apart from that, the internals are what you would expect from a recent Ubuntu release. You do have GNOME 48, you do use Wayland by default, you do have the Linux kernel 6.14, and all the latest toolchain that you might expect in a non-LTS Ubuntu release. Now, Ubuntu 25.04 also brings the new version of apt, the command line package manager that underpins everything in Ubuntu. It's apt 3.0 and it brings a bunch of cool stuff. First, they are much better translations for a bunch of languages, meaning that if you don't speak English, chances are you're gonna have a smoother ride with apt. Apt3 also comes with a better dependency solver, which will make sure that everything that you try to install is up to snuff and that you don't have any conflicts in there. It's only going to be used in Ubuntu 25.04 when the classic solver cannot really find a solution to solve your dependencies, then it will move to this more advanced one. It's still in the evaluation phase, but it should result in less dependency hell on various systems. The output in the terminal is also a bit more legible with a new column view that has been improved and still that color coding green for new stuff, bold for updates and red for removed packages. Now these suggested packages are also now a bit better laid out. This is the stuff that you could install to add some features to what you're currently trying to install, but it's just like recommended or suggested you don't need it for it to work properly. Finally, the apt key command has been deprecated and will no longer work. Uh, apt has moved to a better, more integrated key management, so you don't really need that anymore. Now that's for the Ubuntu specific changes, but Ubuntu 25.04 also comes with some of GNOME 48's changes, which we're gonna take a look at here. The one change that you might or might not notice is the improved performance inside of GNOME 48. So you have the triple buffering patches now merged inside of GNOME. This basically means that screen refresh rates are just smoother, things should be less jittery, and frame rates when moving things around on low-end computers should be much better. Ubuntu already applied these patches, so you will not notice anything specific here, but for users of other distros, it's good. You also have a lot of under the hood optimizations to GNOME JS, which is what powers the GNOME shell, but also to Mutter, the window manager. So you will definitely get better performance in there. You also have HDR support, which I can't really show you because none of my HDR capable monitors seem supported by this feature. They sort of emulate HDR, but they were one of the first generations of HDR displays, and so they don't seem to be recognized as HDR. But you can enable HDR and see it in the settings on the display settings specifically, and turn it on, and it will support a bunch of stuff. You might still need the command line to enable it for specific games and specific things, but GNOME has HDR support baked in for full screen movies, for games, and for mixed content. So. You can try it out if your display is supported, which mine isn't. 
Now GNOME 48 and so Ubuntu 25.04 also has the Wayland cursor shape protocol now, meaning, well, the cursor is now scaled properly at all sizes, shouldn't look bad, all cursor themes should work nicer on Wayland. Basically, it is an improvement for everything related to mouse pointing and how the cursor looks. GNOME 48 also now supports the global keyboard shortcuts portal, meaning you can now add global shortcuts that will trigger even if the application that handles them isn't fully visible or is minimized or is in the system tray. This is something that applications need to support with the proper portal, so you might have to wait a little bit for your favorite app to implement this, but basically when you create a new shortcut, you'll get a pop-up saying, hey, do you want to enable this global shortcut? You click yes, and you'll find them in the basic GNOME shortcuts, which is, well, very nice because that was a big missing piece of Wayland. A change that Ubuntu also keeps from GNOME 48 is the windows being centered by default every new window that you open starting with GNOME 48 and so with Ubuntu 25.04 will be centered and I personally think it is a change for the better but obviously you can always change that and have your window open willy-nilly anywhere on screen if you prefer. Now one change that Ubuntu doesn't keep from GNOME 48 is the new font instead of moving to the Advaita Sans font uh, that GNOME now uses based on Inter, Ubuntu keeps their own Ubuntu font. No one expected them to change but just to be sure, yes they didn't, they're keeping their Ubuntu font. GNOME 48 should also technically group notifications per app, but for the life of me, I cannot get it to trigger on Ubuntu 25.04. Technically, all of these should be grouped. I, I send them with the same app ID. They should be grouped. They're not. And I cannot get any app to display more than two notifications at the same time to even work. They all get dismissed automatically. So it works. I'm sure Ubuntu has it as well, but it's just like incompetence on my part, not managing to have those group notifications. I'll show you a clip of group notifications in GNOME 48 on Fedora where it works. Now in GNOME 48 you also have a bunch of changes to the settings. The first big change is the new digital well-being stuff. It's still pretty bare bones but it's gonna tell you how much time you spent on your computer today and this week. You can obviously disable it if you don't want any data recorded on how much time you spent on your computer. You can set screen time limits with a daily limit which is gonna turn the screen grayscale when you passed it to remind you that you've used your computer too much and you also have some eyesight and movement reminders uh, with a very set schedule of how long it's gonna entice you to take breaks and how much time between breaks you should take and it's just gonna play a sound when a break ends. For now, that's it. Uh, there are apparently some more stuff that they want to add, but for now, it's the only thing you'll get in GNOME 48 and in Ubuntu 25.04. You also have some changes to the power screen. First, the power saver options are now moved to a specific tab instead of everything being grouped. And if your computer supports it, you are able to set a charge limit of 80%, meaning that if your laptop stays plugged in at all times, it's gonna save the battery uh, health, basically, by not charging it to the max every time. It's gonna cap at 80% and leave you with a healthier battery over time. And that's about it for all the changes to Ubuntu 25.04. It is not a major release. It's also not an LTS one, so it's not gonna be supported for a long time, but just the changes in GNOME 48 really warrant the upgrade if you don't usually stick to LTS updates. I would like to see more work on the Snap ecosystem as a whole. It's gotten a lot better with the addition of permissions, with packages that are more reactive, open a bit faster, integrate better with portals, and generally tend to not use as many resources as they once did. I think they're sort of on par with flat packs right now, but the permission system isn't fully fleshed out yet. It doesn't look super good. The interface is too convoluted. So hopefully we're going to see more developments in that specific area in the next version 25.10. For now, 25.04 is a good upgrade if you want HDR support and you want a little bit better performance in GNOME, it's definitely worth a shot if you don't plan on staying on the LTS one. Now, of course, all the usual Ubuntu flavors get their updates as well. So you get Plasma 6.3 inside of Kubuntu, but that's about it.
Ubuntu Budgie gets Budgie version 10.9.2, which adds a bunch of applets and various small tweaks here and there. But more importantly, they're gonna ship a PPA that lets you try out version 10.10 .10 of the Budgie desktop, which will default to Wayland instead of x.org. So this will be an interesting one to follow, but it's not out yet as far as I could tell. Ubuntu Mate still uses the version of Mate that all Ubuntu releases have used for a long, long time. No changes to report here. Ubuntu Studio doesn't have any specific changes compared to Kubuntu and the customizations and apps that they add on top of it. Now the big changes probably come to Xubuntu users because you get a major update to XFC 4.20 released at the end of December 2024 and it introduces experimental Wayland support in XFC 4.20 meaning that you are sort of future proof now when using this thing although the support isn't finished by any means. You get some changes in the file manager with a couple of new toolbar buttons and options that you can pick. It also supports client-side decoration with a header bar if you like that. The panel has more configuration options. All the various applets got some options and tweaks as well, including the show desktop applet that can show the desktop when hovering it with the mouse. You've got a better task list, a better clock. You have power profiles support inside of XFC as well. The window that lets you set up how your displays are mirrored or extended has a few more options and is more legible as well. You now have a checkbox in the mouse and touchpad settings to toggle between adaptive and flat mouse acceleration profiles and you can also enable high resolution scrolling inside of XFCE. And you also have a bunch of other settings and options. Basically XFC 4.20 is a major update to XFC 4.18 after I think it was two years of development. So it's definitely a worthwhile update if you're using Xubuntu. Don't wait for another LTS, just move on to this one because it's going to give you a lot of changes for your desktop. Other flavors don't really bring a lot apart maybe from Kubuntu, which has of course Plasma, which evolves fairly fast. The other ones don't move that quickly. Anyway, this will be it for Ubuntu 25.04. It is an evolutionary update, but depending on the desktop you use, it is definitely worth updating to it. I'd say if you use GNOME, Plasma or XFC, absolutely perform the update. If you don't use one of these three major desktops, it's probably not a mandatory one and you can wait a little bit. Although personally, I won't wait to tell you about our sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. They sell laptops and desktops that come with Linux pre-installed. And why that would be a better option than buying something with Windows and slapping Linux on it? Well, it's because you know the hardware works really well with Linux. They even write drivers for the parts that don't work perfectly well so everyone can have a good experience. I only use Tuxedo computers these days. They offer something for everyone at every price point. You have a lot of customization options for the hardware, for the look of the device, for the keyboard layout you use for having your own logo engraved on the lid of your laptop. They're really, really solid and I can only recommend them. Everything I do on this channel, on my podcast, is done on one of their laptops running Tuxedo OS, which is their own custom Ubuntu-based distro. It's fantastic. So take a look at Tuxedo Computers. The link is in the description of the video. Anyway, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. You know where all the usual YouTube buttons are. Click them if you want to make the channel grow a little bit faster. And in the meantime, thank you all for watching. And I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.